Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ether Hub. I'm Simon here with a new Magic the Gathering story. Fresh off the heels of our adventures on Innistrad, we step boldly to a new world, Kamigawa. Fans of the channel will recognize Kamigawa as the heavily Japanese folklore-inspired plane that was first introduced several years ago. Even here on the channel, I discussed the entire history of Kamigawa, as well as its potential future impacts in a giant, comprehensive video. If you'd like a refresher course on Kamigawa, I highly suggest you go check out that video. You can find it linked on your screen right now or down in the description below. Now we return to Kamigawa with Neon Dynasty that introduces a Kamigawa far flung into the future with a whole new Hextech cyberpunky aesthetic. Still, the story will draw heavily from the foundation laid down in this plane's past. The connection to the Yumazawa family, the Hyozen Reckoners, the importance of Kami to everyday life, all of that will play a big role in Neon Dynasty's story. So let's not waste any more time and learn about a new character in the MTG storyline, Kato, a young rogue destined for greatness, much like another character from Kamigawa's past. This is just the beginning of Kato's origins in chapter one of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty written by Akami Bowman, a missing emperor. Before we begin, I'm calling out to all who may have some slight voice acting experience who may be interested in providing voice lines for these dramatic readings. If you're interested, drop me an email. I know I'm not as good of a voice actor as I am a narrator, so if you want, you can come be a part of the Etherhub team. And with that, let's get back to the lore. The street was crawling with Kami tonight. The Lantern Festival was a favorite for many of Tawashi's night-loving spirits. On any other day, Kato might have appreciated the extra camouflage. Part of his job required the ability to move through the streets unseen, and hordes of Kami were an ideal solution. But he was running out of time. If he didn't finish the job soon, he'd lose a payday to another Reckoner. It hadn't taken Kato long to find his target. Gamblers were notoriously bad at keeping secrets, and this one had a history of debt and soured friendships. But if Kato moved too soon, he'd risk scaring him off. And on a night like this, with heavy crowds and an abundance of firework displays, there were a thousand places for a stranger to hide. A group of children ran past Kato with sparklers in their fists, shrieking with delight. He flinched at the sound. It had only been a year since the Emperor went missing. Twelve months since Kato chased the mysterious stranger out of Kaodai's temple. The rest of Kamigawa may have been carrying on as normal, but when Kato saw the bright red festival lanterns floating through the sky, the skewers of syrup-soaked rice dumplings in every street stall, and the kami of exultant revelry blazing across the rooftops in all its twinkling glory, he didn't feel an ounce of joy. All he could think about was his friend. Kato would save his celebrating for the day the Emperor came home. He stepped beneath the canopy of neon paracels that kept the street vendors sheltered, where a trio of electric kami squabbled near one of the faltering outdoor heaters. The smallest of the three spirits leapt up, and the floating metal orbs around its industrial-style body flashed with irritation. Kato threw up a hand to shield his eyes from the bright light, blinking several times before the kami scattered across the street to find another source of energy. When his vision readjusted, he was almost certain he'd lost sight of his target entirely, and he probably would have if it weren't for the man's garish coat. The edges glowed a fluorescent yellow, and the rest of it was patterned with glossy hieroglyphic koi. It was a bold choice for a man who owed Sataru Yumazawa money. But there was always something about festivals that tricked people into letting their guard down. Soundlessly, Kato approached the man dressed in yellow, watching as he perched himself on one of the thin wooden chairs outside a curry stall. He leaned across the table, speaking in rushed, loose words to a woman with flour smeared across her forehead and drops of curry splattered on her apron. The Hyozen Reckoners wouldn't want a witness. Kato needed to be careful. He slipped between the approaching customers, moving as if he were no more than a wisp of smoke in the shadows. He walked behind the man without stopping, and in one fluid sweep of his hand, Kato reached into the man's coat and retrieved his wallet. The man didn't feel a thing. Kato made sure of it. 
Following the shifting crowd to the edge of the market, Kato distanced himself from the mark. When he was sure he hadn't been followed, Kato paused at the street corner, opened the wallet, and counted the translucent banknotes inside. Most people on Kamagawa were happier using credit chips attached to their wrists, but anyone with a penchant for gambling wouldn't be silly enough to use wearable tech. Those who frequent Tawashi's card dens had a saying, only risk what you're willing to lose. To avoid the temptation of risking everything, gamblers preferred physical money over credit chips. Luckily for Kato, he picked up a few new skills over the years, pickpocketing being one of them. He thumbed through the notes, counting a second time just to be sure before removing the miniature tablet from his pocket. One day, he hoped he'd be able to afford hands-free tech like the retina lenses he'd seen some of the other Reckoners wear, but for now, the outdated comm would have to do. The device scanned his eyes, and a blurry hologram materialized. Kato waved a finger, scrolling through details of every act of listing, until a pixelated image of the gambler's face appeared. Below was the man's name, how much money he owed Satoru, and tip-offs as to where he might be hiding. Kato typed a coded message into the device and hit send. The target's listing flashed from blue to red before vanishing, and the space it left behind was the word, completed. Across Kamagawa, the Hyazen Reckoners would receive the same alert. They'd know Kato cleared another job, and that he'd be on the way to Satoru's den in the Undercity to collect the bounty. Kato stuffed the device back in his pocket, the sound of festival drums and fireworks echoing behind him. It was true that he wasn't ready to celebrate, but that didn't mean he wasn't hungry. Kato pulled a few of the extra notes from the gambler's wallet, walked up to the nearest stall, and bought the biggest dumpling skewer he could find. As he made his way to the train station, Shoyu dripping down his hand, Kato decided that even though working for Sadaru hadn't been his first choice, being a Reckoner certainly had its perks. The Undercity was shadowed by looming skyscrapers and vibrant cherry trees that failed to mask the stench of the open sewers nearby. Kato had been doing jobs for the Heisen Reckoners for nearly a year. He'd grown used to the worst parts of Towashi's underbelly. He'd even grown used to the people, and they were far worse than anything that came out of the sewer. Kato held his wrist up to the paneled door, and the red light scanned the wearable keycard. Security was mild in comparison to the Imperial Palace, but no one with any sense would ever attempt to break into Reckoner territory. The security system was merely a formality. The door slid open, and Kato followed a metal staircase down a wide lobby where card tables littered the room and a neon counter lined the back wall. Reckoners were perched on chairs and standing in doorways, most of their faces partially hidden by masks elaborately decorated with teeth and sharp horns. Colorful tattoos were visible on their arms. Some of the underlings only had one or two, but the higher-ups had tattoos that spread from their wrists all the way to their shoulders. For most Reckoners, their loyalty tattoo was their first. If they betrayed Sadaru, the initiation mark would eat into their flesh, eventually leading to a slow and painful death. Kato wasn't the youngest underling amongst them, but being on the cusps of 16 made him just young enough to avoid initiation. He tried not to think about how long that would last. It wasn't that Kato intended to be disloyal. Sadaru had given him a job, after all, not to mention a place to live and food to eat. If it weren't for the Hyozen, Kato would have still been wandering to Washi, surviving off the few coins he managed to scrounge up from the gutters, and maybe a few more from the pockets of unsuspecting strangers. But Kato hadn't joined the Hyozen Reckoners for the money. The gang's extensive network gave him access to every scrap of criminal information that ever existed. If anyone was going to know about a man with a metal arm, it would be Sadaru's spies. If it meant finding the Emperor's assailant, Kato would suffer a loyalty tattoo and stay in the Undercity for as long as it took. It was a small price to pay to bring his friend home. A burly figure wearing sculpted, insect-style armor stood in Kato's path, brows as thick as caterpillars. He huffed, breath sour and eyes bloodshot. You stole my mark. Kato eyed the man's katana, its edges glowing a merciless red. Most of the Reckoner's weapons were laced with poisons and illegal enchantments, 
All Kato had was a thin knife that was more suited for slicing fruit than it was for drawing blood. But the last time he'd gone to the armory, the knife was all he could afford. Kato had never been one to shy away from confrontation, but he couldn't deny that they were unevenly matched. So he fought back with his words and hoped it wouldn't cost him a broken nose. It's a name on a list. It's fair game. Kato bit back coolly. Not my fault, you were too slow to get there first. The Reckoner whistled through his crooked teeth. <laughs> that gambler was only tagged as a mark this morning. How did you manage to find him so quickly? It was a festival, Kato remarked. People go where the food is. I'd say you got lucky, but you don't even have blood on your hands. He narrowed his eyes. If you're stalling for time, trying to keep the rest of us from him just so you can score a bounty. At the suggestion, a few of the other Reckoners glanced up from the nearby card table. One was a muscular woman with metal gloves trailing up her elbows, each finger pointed and needle sharp. Kato had seen her work before. One swipe of her hand would leave a special kind of poison that caused venomous flowers to blossom from a person's wounds. I know about the code, Kato said and he made sure the others could hear him too. And I don't need to lie just to get a payday or rough up a target just to make myself feel important. He shrugged. The listing said he owed money, so I got the money. You're cocky for an underling and too soft belly for a reckoner. The man tilted his head accusingly. Mercy is for the Imperials. It wasn't mercy, Kato snapped back. I just don't see the point in wasting time making someone bleed when there are plenty of other jobs I could be doing. We aren't paid by the hour. No, the woman with the metal fingers chimed in, a hint of a tattoo appearing along her collarbone. But it sure is fun to make them beg. The others laughed in response, and the sound went straight through Kato's core like an icy dagger. He knew if he weren't careful, he might someday find the same kind of dagger in his back. A tall woman with jet black hair appeared, and the laughter ceased. Kato felt the chill seep through his bones, filling him with a sense of emptiness. Wisps of black smoke circled around her like phantom serpents. Unlike those who channel Kami magic through mutual respect, this woman took a different approach to channeling. She'd allow Azimaki, the kami of treachery incarnate, to possess her, and by the looks of it, more than once. She believed doing so gave her prophetic hallucinations and visions of what would come to be. All Kato could see was the dying gray color of her skin, and the way the black of her eyes spilled out into the whites, like the kami hadn't just borrowed a part of her, it had consumed her very soul. Satoru wishes to speak with you, she said in a hollow voice, sweeping a hand towards one of the back rooms. Kato followed her without a word, happy to leave the others behind, but he felt his nerves jolt to life across his skin. It was rare for Satoru to summon anyone. When he did, the people who stepped into his office usually came out with one less finger, or several missing teeth, if they came out alive at all. Kato felt the weight of the stranger's wallet. Did Satoru know he'd taken some of the money to buy dumpling skewers? Kato had counted the money several times over. There was plenty to cover the mark's debt. What Kato took was extra. It couldn't possibly be seen as stealing from Satoru, could it? The woman pushed the door open, and Kato stepped clumsily inside, eyes glowing wide, when he saw Satoru sitting behind its desk. Bright tattoos trailing all the way up to the bottom of his ears. His black hair was wound in a tight bun, and a harsh expression knotted his entire face. Metal armor was latched strategically across his chest and arms, but there were windowed panels across his shoulders and stomach that showed off his colorful markings. A gas mask hung from his neck, neon green with painted blue swirls, making it look like the jaws of a monster. Satoru didn't motion for Kato to sit. He didn't say a word. He simply stared in a way that made Kato's knees falter. Sir, I, I, I can explain, Kato said quickly. I, I, I knew I'd be bringing you a profit on top of the debt, and 
I I'd been trailing this guy since the afternoon, so when I, when I smelled the shoyu... Sadaru held up his hand to interrupt, and Kato snapped his mouth shut. When the leader of the Hyozen Reckoners still didn't speak, Kato pulled the wallet out of his pocket and set it carefully on the table behind them. Sadaru's eyes dropped before gesturing to the nearby channeler. She took the wallet and moved away to count the contents. After a moment, she simply nodded. Sadaru pressed his elbows against the table and clasped his hands together, leaning in. I'm impressed by how well you're able to trail your marks. This is the third time this week you cleared a name from the list on the same day it went up. Kato swallowed, clenching his fists as if he was protecting his fingers. However, Sadaru said, while your efficiency is worthy of praise, I'm not sure you've grasped what it means to send a message. Kato's throat burned. He needed this job. He needed to be somewhere he could help the Emperor. He couldn't afford to let Saru doubt him. There are Reckoners who can send a message, but they don't clear as many names off your list as I do. Kato knew he was being too bold, but it was all he could do to mask the cracks in his voice. I'm the best underling you have. Yet, you have no loyalty mark. Sadaru motioned to Kato's bare skin, and then to the large screen against the wall. Surveillance feeds from the lobby appeared in rectangles. He'd been watching them the whole time. It seems I'm not the only one who wonders whether you have the stomach for this job. I'm here because I want to be. Yes, yes, Sadaru paused. You lived in Enganjo before you came to us. I have seen Imperial Samurai leave the palace for a different kind of life. And every now and then, one of them winds up here. But they leave because they see a broken system. His eyes darkened. You don't strike me as someone who cares much about systems. The memory of his childhood made Kato's cheeks burn. He still felt guilty. Not about leaving the palace, but for leaving Echo behind. Not that she would have followed him beyond the wall. Her heart belonged to the palace and everything it stood for. Kato's heart didn't really belong to anything. At least not anything that could easily be explained. Kato stiffened. I ran away because I knew the things I wanted out of life weren't things I was going to find in Nganjo. And what is it do you want? The Hyozen boss replied. Kato shrugged. <laughs> Money, a better sword, and in his thoughts, to find out what happened to the Emperor and bring her home. At that, Sadaru chuckled, brow still furrowed. Ha! <laughs> I have a job for you, he said finally. One that isn't on the list. Uh, a job? Kato blinked with relief. Maybe he'd get to keep his fingers after all. Sadaru leaned back in his chair. There's a moon folk on Ottawara, a futurist prodigy as they're calling him, who is prototyping a way to connect tech and kami. His research would sell for a high price on the black market. And it's only a matter of time before Hyozen's rivals hear about it and get the same idea. He tilted his head, studying Kato carefully before dipping his chin. I want you to bring me the schematics. The pay would be good, black market dealings always were, but it would also be a way to prove his loyalty to Sadaru, without having to send any messages. Kato gave a curt nod. Consider it done. I'll send you the details through your comm. Sadaru waved a hand. You can see yourself out. Kato left the room, ignoring the way the channeler watched him with black, assessing eyes. And once he was out in the street, under the shadows of a high rise, he pulled out his tablet just in time to see the private message flash up on his hollow screen. There was only a photo and a name. Tamishi. And there you guys go, chapter one of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty story. In just this small bit following the origins of Kato, we learn a lot about modern day Kamigawa. The advancement of technology seems to be made possible because of the harmony following the original Kamigawa story. With humans and Kami again living in peace, as made evident from the festival going on, progress was made on the plane leading to this cyberpunk landscape. 
We also find vestiges of Yumazawa's lineage in this story. The leader of the modern Hayazen Reckoners is a descendant of Toshiro Yumazawa, the hero of original Kamigawa. Sadaru Yumazawa has carried on his family's legacy, leading the Hayozen Reckoners, a band of mercenaries that Toshiro once joined, betrayed, and then came to terms with. It's great to see the Reckoners are still operating, looking more like a bounty hunting organization now, but still with powerful underground tie-ins. Sadaru too looks to be a different breed of Yumazawa, not just a rogue, but a powerful figure, front and center in command as the big boss, the head honcho, which isn't what we really expect from a Yumazawa. The relationship between Kami and mortals is still shown here, with one of Sadaru's guards channeling the spirit of a rather nasty Kami. This was something we saw in the original Kamigawa story, and it's nice to see that Kami are still going to play a big role in Neon Dynasty. As for the story itself, Kato is a young character, just 16 years old, who grew up in Nganjo, the capital city of Kamigawa and the seat of the Emperor. The modern day Emperor is, I guess, female and has apparently gone missing, which the rest of the plane either doesn't know about or doesn't really seem to care much. Kato, on the other hand, does care, and so he's looking to bring her back. But what does the Empress's absence mean for Kamigawa? Will the balance between mortals and Kami be disrupted as it did before? And who took her? Kato says it was a man with a metal arm, and no trace of her has been seen since. Clearly, this is setting up Tezzeret, the evil planeswalker and former pawn of Bolas, as likely the main antagonist. Though it seems anyone on modern Kamigawa could have a metal arm, the story points to perhaps Tezzeret capturing the Empress and using the planar portal within himself to ferry her off of Kamigawa. This may be a stretch as the planar portal really only can transport non-organic material, but I'm sure we're going to find out more as the story progresses. So stay tuned for chapter 2 as Kato finds his new mark and discovers something rather curious about the Kami and himself. Anyway guys, thank you so much for joining me for this story. Remember, you can help support the Ether Hub by liking the video, leaving a comment, and becoming a subscriber. It all goes a long way in helping grow our community. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, see ya!